think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us tonight for our presentation through the Looking Glass, Studying and Reducing Bird Window Collisions. Um, my name is Beth Hershey. I'm actually a board member for the library here as well as a board member for Powered Up Baraboo. And both of those organizations are actually co-hosting this presentation tonight. Um, I want to give a shout out to members of Baraboo Buds, which is the library's gardening club, which I believe there are quite a few members here tonight. Usually I think they meet at this date and time, and so they came to this presentation. So thank you for joining us. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Powered Up Baraboo is a local nonprofit that was formed about five years ago, whose mission is to increase energy efficiency and to increase the use of renewable energy and other sustainable practices um, to reduce harmful greenhouse gas emissions. And so part of Powered Up Baraboo, there are four action teams. Um, one of those is the Green Spaces team. And that team works to support and protect native plants and insects and birds. And so I just wanna give you a little background on why we're co-hosting this event tonight, this presentation. Uh, back in 2016, the city of Baraboo became a bird city, largely through the efforts of um, a local land trust, um, Baraboo Range Preservation Association, and our Park and Recs Department. And so to, become, to be a bird city, there's a number of criteria that must be met on an ongoing basis every year. And as you can imagine, most of those have to do with protecting not only birds, but also the native green spaces and the local food, the food sources that these birds need in order to survive successfully. Um, so Baraboo became a bird city, and then during the COVID years, its status as a bird city kind of fell by the wayside, because part of it is a lot of community outreach and education, and of course that was not able to happen during COVID years. So earlier this year, Powered Up Baraboo's Green Spaces team decided to pick up the reins and to complete those criteria again so that Baraboo could regain its status. Um, so back in February, we finally completed the application process and handed that in. And I'm really excited to announce that as of this morning, we learned that yes, Baraboo is now a bird city once again. Shake up for drum roll. Um, so, and that leads us to actually our lecture tonight, why we're co hosting this, is one of the criteria that communities need to do is they have to recognize World Migratory Bird Day and actually hold community outreach and education about migratory birds. And so Powered Up Baraboo did a number of events. Uh, World Migratory Bird Day this year was on May 11th, this past Saturday. And so we had on Saturday at our local arboretum here in Baraboo, a number of wildlife ecologists, ecologist scientists from um, UW-Madison came out and they did bird banding demonstrations for the public, talking about um, why they're banding these birds and their efforts to do bird conservation on migratory birds, so we did that on Saturday, and then we also did that again with the same group of scientists um, Monday morning for, for some second grade classes from our local school district, so that was really fun. And so then we're all gathered here tonight to continue our education on migratory birds and talk about the really devastating impact bird window collisions have on bird populations <coughs> during spring and fall migrations, as well as all throughout the year, and what we can do to mitigate that. So before I introduce our speaker, Brenna, I just want to make sure everyone had a chance to either before or after to look at all the information we have on the tables out there. There's a lot of information about Powered Up Baraboo, how you can get involved. There's information about um, upcoming library pro programs and their summer programs. Um, Brenna brought a lot of great information about um, the Southern Wisconsin Bird Alliance. And if you haven't signed up for our door prize drawings, please do. Some of those will be for some of these markers you see on the windows up here, which are, um, um, something that you can put on the windows for to prevent the bird window collision. So, um, so without any further um, ado, I want to introduce uh, Brenna Marzacek. Um, she is the Director of Outreach for the Southern Wisconsin Bird Alliance. Um, through her work there, she coordinates or supports a lot of volunteer citizen science programs, um, including the Bird Collision Corps, which she may talk about a little bit tonight, as well as Bald Eagle Nest Watch, the Kestrel Nest Box Monitoring Program, and the Madison Area Christmas Bird Count. Brenda really loves helping homeowners and building occupants and communities become more bird friendly and sustainable. So please join me in welcoming Brenna. Thank you. 
All right, thank you all very much for being here. As Beth said, my name is Brenda Marsicek. Um, first of all, congratulations on getting Bird City status again. That, that's a lot of work and it's pretty tedious work. So it takes you know, the right people with persistence to do that. Uh, congratulations. Um, okay, so we're here tonight to talk about bird window collisions and how we can prevent them, how we know that they're happening, um, and what we can do about them. So raise your hand if you have seen or heard a bird hit your window. Yes, okay, for those watching online, that was everybody in the room. Um, and this is the answer I get every single time I ask this question. I used to think when I was a kid that this was a rare phenomenon, that I was getting my hair cut one day when I was about 10, and in the next room over, we hear this huge crash, we run into the room of my hair cutter's living room and there on the floor was a ring neck pheasant. And we looked at the pheasant dead on the floor and then what used to be a window and then to her beautifully landscaped yard. And you know, it wasn't hard to connect the dots, but at the time I thought this was like a freak thing that me and maybe a couple other people had seen this, witnessed this. And it turns out, you know, 100% of people have seen and witnessed this. So um, one of the great things about this problem is that it's something we can solve. This is something that we can do something about in an afternoon or a weekend, and it has instant positive benefits for birds. So I'm excited that you're here, even though this isn't like the happy topic of bird banding or you know, planting flowers, I'm glad that you're here to talk about this. So just a brief introduction to Southern Wisconsin Bird Alliance. We used to be called Madison Audubon and recently um, changed our name. So we have three primary ways of achieving our mission of bird conservation. One is through habitat restoration. We own and steward about 2,500 acres of land in Southern Wisconsin, primarily in three sanctuaries. One is outside of Arlington called Goose Pond Sanctuary. One is outside of Lake Mills called Fable Grove Sanctuary, and the third is called Fair Meadows Sanctuary uh, outside of Milton near Janesville. So um, all of that, the land that we steward is uh, restored or is in active restoration to na native habitats and great places for birds to rest and refuel if they're migrating or uh, build nests or find food or uh, just have a safe place to reside. We also have a full education program, so our educators go to community centers and classrooms and share a love of nature with students. Um, and they work exclusively at schools and community centers where 50% or more of the students are students of color or on uh, uh, free or, or reduced lunch, so low income families. And this is part of our mission to ensure that birding is for everyone, including people who have been excluded from conservation and years past. Uh, and we also do a lot of work with advocacy, so alerting our members when there's a legislation proposed or some issue going on that they may care about and want to raise their voice about uh, through citizen science and research and advocacy for um, change in communities and that type of thing. And all of this is done in 10 counties in southern Wisconsin, including in the area of Baraboo. So, if you are not a member, I would love to meet you and welcome you to our flock if you want to become a member. Um, or if you don't, that's okay too, and you are always welcome to participate in the things that we're, we have going on. We <clears throat> often have field trips in the Baraboo area. Also, uh, another night of birds comes tomorrow night. So this is a talk that's happening here in this room tomorrow night. Also. Um, co-sponsored by Southern Wisconsin Bird Alliance <coughs> and talking about birds in faraway places. I mean, sandhill cranes we have here, but the rest of them are faraway birds and, and really fun to talk about. So if you're free tomorrow evening, come back. Okay, so let's talk about birds and window collisions. I wanna start by talking about who cares? Who cares if a few birds hit a window? Um, who cares about birds in general, right? Like why do they matter? Uh, so I don't think I'll have to work too hard to get this group to care about birds, but um, let's start by talking about that birds in and of themselves are awesome and make life better. 
there are re scientific research uh, studies that show that people being able to hear and see birds has measurable positive benefit to their mental health and physical well-being. So just being around birds is a good thing. Having been able to see them nest, see their young, hear their songs, these are parts of what make life joyful. They're also really important to um, ecosystem services, including pollination and seed dispersal, and they eat things like ticks and mosquitoes and all sorts of spiders, and they're also eaten by other things, so a really important part of the food web. And they offer, um, so they, they're an important part of the, uh, the um, economy. So bird watching is a multi-billion dollar industry in the United States, including part of that is in Wisconsin. Um, so sales relating to bird watching, restaurants and binocular sales and hotel stays are all part of that too. And so you know, birds hitting windows is a, is a very big and vast problem. So this graphic here is pretty busy, but what I hope you notice is that there are three different types of buildings here of different sizes, <clears throat> and they each uh, account for a different part of the bird collision problem. So this says uh, 599 million birds per year. That number is estimated up to 1 billion birds die every single year after hitting windows in just the United States, every single year. And almost half of those happen at homes. So about 44% of those collisions happen at uh, residences that are between one and three stories tall. The other half ha happen at low-rise buildings, so between four and 11 stories, office buildings, apartment buildings, and so on. A lot of people think of skyscrapers as the big problem, and they do in fact kill a lot of birds. Each building kills more birds than any of these other buildings uh, individually. <clears throat> but there are relatively few skyscrapers on the landscape, so they account for 0.1% of the collision problem. So homes and low-rise buildings are, are where it's at, and that's basically all of Wisconsin, right? So how does this rank in comparison to other things that humans are doing to, you know, cause trouble for birds? At the top of the list is outdoor cats as the leading cause of human direct cause of uh, bird deaths due to humans. So these are barn cats, house cats that get outside, outdoor cats, feral cats, whatever type of cat it is, they are adorable, but they are very talented and ferocious hunters, and they love birds. Right behind that is window collisions, number two on the list. So this is um, a big problem. So why does it happen? What about birds and windows is such a problematic mix. So let's start by uh, looking at this really adorable American red start. This is a warbler species. Um, and you can see that her eyes are on the side of her head. This is typical for songbirds, right? Because they need to be able to see predators coming, but this also changes the way that they perceive depth as they're flying. Um, and birds' bones are hollow, which makes them light enough to fly, but it also makes it very bad if they hit something solid. They're more fragile if they hit something solid, so the, the impact has a, a more damage to their body. They also don't have the benefit of speaking our language, right? Mm -hmm. So we learn from a young age that when you look at something like this, it has a dark frame around it, and there's something bright and interesting in the middle, that this is a window. You're looking through a window, right? We know this, we've learned this at a young age, but even people run into windows and glass doors all the time, even knowing this, right? So birds not having the benefit of learning this, uh, being taught this, um, they, they don't learn that this is something to avoid just by looking at the frames around the windows. Birds also, songbirds, primarily migrate at night. So um, as they are migrating through at night, they have to be able to see where they're flying. If there is bad weather, a low cloud cover, the birds have to be lower down under the clouds in order to see where they're going, which puts them in line more with buildings. Um, and it also 
means that when they come down in the wee hours of the morning to rest and refuel, they see something like this that's confusing and at the same time it's very tantalizing, right? They see this, this tree that they, it seems like they should be able to fly through or fly to. Maybe there's um, food there or a place where they can rest or some place to hide from a predator. So they would fly toward this, not realizing that this is a window, right? So reflection is one of the main drivers of window collisions. And for those of you who have had a bird hit a window at your home, I encourage you to look at your window from the outside and see what might be reflected in that window. <clears throat> Another uh, setup about uh, or setup with windows that is problematic for birds is uh, what's called a pass-through effect. So this is when there's one pane of windows that runs parallel with another pane of windows and you can see in through one and right out the other. It creates the illusion that they can just fly right through that space. So skywalks are hot spots for collisions because they have this really clear space. That it looks clear that birds can fly through and they don't realize that this is something solid. Um, there are also uh, ways of connecting different parts of homes that create this illusion, this pass-through effect. And uh, patio areas or uh, four-season rooms that have glass, even at, in modest homes, like at my house, I can see in through my living room window and right out back the, the patio door in the back of my house into the backyard. So it doesn't take a mansion or a fancy building to do this. Um, a lot of houses have this situation, and, and so this is another thing that you can look for if you do a walk around your house. Just see if you can look in through one set of windows and out another. And then having lights on at night is another um, problem for birds. There's something about lights that draws them in, um, and as they get closer to the light, they obviously will get closer to buildings. And even if they don't hit the window, having the lights on keeps them in this area and they just fly around very confused for a while. And so they can suffer from exhaustion and in some cases die from exhaustion. Okay, so ways that we are studying this problem in the Madison area, um, is through the Bird Collision Core program. This is a volunteer citizen science program uh, that we run through Southern Wisconsin Bird Alliance with many partners. So all of the sites that you see up here are places that we um, did surveys within the last year or so. Um, a couple of these we're not surveying at this spring, but we've swapped them out for other sites. So we usually have around a dozen or so sites that volunteers are monitoring at. Uh, during spring and fall migration. And what they're doing is walking around buildings looking for dead birds, right? This takes a really special person <laughs> to want to get up early in the morning going out looking for dead birds, but it is really important because they're able to document where exactly these birds are hitting windows, and then through the course of time collecting Lots of data points were able to provide recommendations to building owners about which buildings specifically are the problem ones and how they can fix them, what window treatments they can put up to reduce, mitigate that problem. So the process for Bird Collision Core is that we, we uh, reach out to building owners to get them on board with this program before we even begin surveying here. And this is because we don't want anyone to feel like they've been bamboozled with someone saying, your building is killing birds and how dare you. Uh, we want them to be bought into this from the start. And so if we find that there's a problem area, they're more likely to do something about it, right? They're already interested in what the findings are. So we uh, partner with building owners. We recruit volunteers to do each person does a survey once a week, and we have enough volunteers that we have seven days a week coverage at most or all of our buildings. And then uh, they walk around the perimeter of the buildings and document where they find dead or injured birds. So then um, after each season is over, each survey period is over, we provide a report to all of the building owners and then some recommendations for mitigation. And through this work, our volunteers have found that these are the top 
nine bird species that are affected by window collisions. This is, these species are what they most often pick up. Some of these are some of our favorite species of birds, right? There's cedar waxwings up here. There are ruby-throated hummingbirds, different types of warblers, and great native sparrows. There are big birds, small birds. Some are, you know, somewhat residents, or, or um, at least some uh, robins and morning doves stay here in the winter. Uh, many of these are long-distance migrants. Juncos arrive just for winter. The rest of these birds are here just for the breeding season. So they come from far away a lot of, a lot of times, and they're on the move, right? It makes sense that these migratory birds are most affected by window collisions because they have to move in spring and fall. They are flying with purpose and intent and speed. And so just by numbers, they're more likely to come in, in contact with buildings because they're moving more than, um, than resident birds would be. And during migration, especially, you know, and, and during the summer, they're um, setting up their nesting territory and they're staying pretty put. So uh, summer tends to be less of an issue for collisions. And through all of this, we've collected thousands of data points. Um, you can see that fall 2021 was an especially bad year for window collisions. But in general, fall is about twice the number of collisions as spring. Um, and this is likely because it's right after the nesting season, there are more birds on the landscape in general, and many of them are migrating for the first time. So fall is a particularly hard time for birds when it comes to window collisions. And as a result of our work, we've been able to partner with building owners to make some changes to their buildings. So this is one example. This is Aug Residence Hall on the UW-Madison campus. Uh, prior, the before and after of the data are great. It's been about a 90% re reduction of window collisions. And this, they're using the dots up there. This is another example at American Family Insurance. Their national headquarters is in Madison. And uh, the, their sky, this skywalk here was killing, this small skywalk here was killing as many or more birds as their biggest building. And so this is a, an example of how skywalks are really uh, terrible places for window collisions. But they put up a window treatment and here too it reduced it by more than 90 I think it was 93%. Um, this is another site uh, that we work with, Holy Wisdom Monastery in Middleton. They had a hot spot and they put up window treatments. And then this is, as of yesterday, the Jope Residence Hall in UW-Madison put up a window collision there too. This is a north-facing set of windows. As far down as you can see in that picture is big, a big wall of windows and it faces Lake Mendota and the woods there, and so they get a ton of collisions, but hopefully not anymore. And then throughout the city of Madison, our, our data helped inform and move forward Madison's Bird Safe Glass Ordinance, which is the first ordinance in the state of Wisconsin of its kind. As you might expect, it was almost immediately uh, pushed back against by a developer group. So, uh, developer group sued the city of Madison, and uh, in 2022, a judge upheld the ordinance, and then again in 2023, a Wisconsin court upheld the ordinance, so it's now officially in the clear, um, and all through this time, it was in effect. So if you drive through Madison and you see big buildings going up, look for dots on the glass because they are required to use them if they're a certain size of building using a certain amount of glass. And then another good news, in February, Middleton passed the exact same ordinance. So now Madison and Middleton both have this bird safe glass ordinance in place. So um, these big glassy buildings here look like death traps for birds, but they all have the material or a, a way of producing the glass um, where it includes patterns that are baked or etched into the glass during the production process. It's called frit. So this glass comes to the building while the building is being constructed already bird safe. It's wonderful. Um, so these buildings that you see here, the top left one is the CUNA Mutual Building on the west side of Madison. It's an enormous building that has all glass on the north side. 
And we studied it for Berg Collision Core, and we found very few collisions here. Not zero, but I think it was seven. And all of those happened at places where there, there wasn't frit. So like at a glass entryway um, that didn't have any frit on it. So it's wonderful to have uh, building owners taking up this requirement. And actually, in the case of CUNA Mutual, they did it before the ordinance was in place on, on their own free choice. Yeah. So when we're talking about bird safe glass, bird safe anything, how do we know that a window treatment, whatever it is, is bird safe, right? Like my dishwasher soap says it's eco-friendly. Like it doesn't mean that it is. They, anyone can say this. So how do we know? American Bird Conservancy is a non, national nonprofit that does a ton of research around window collisions. And a way that they are able to test window treatments is using glass testing tunnels. So this is what a glass testing tunnel looks like. There are two in the country and they're both located at bird banding stations. So these are all already places where birds are coming in and in hand and scientists are handling the bird for other research purposes. So at one end you see that there is a scientist and on the other end there is something that looks like sky. And if you're looking down the tunnel, this is what it looks like. There are two sets of windows. One has a window treatment on it, and the other has no window treatment, so it's just clear glass. And in front of both is a mist net, so no birds get hurt during this process. Um, so they, the, the scientists ban the bird, they weigh the bird, they do whatever processing they need for that, and then they take the ones that are least stressed, and they send it down the tunnel one time. And Depending on which way the bird goes, if it goes toward the window treatment, that window treatment gets a poor score, right? Because it means that it didn't work. If they fly away from the window treatment, it gets a better score because the bird saw that there was something on that window. Um, so they do this many times with different birds. No bird goes down more than once. And um, over time, they're able to come up with what's called a material threat factor. So if there's a material threat factor of one, it means that a bird flew to that window treatment only one time out of a hundred. So a low number is good. <coughs> All of the window treatments that we're going to talk about in the next part of the talk here will have a material threat factor associated with them so you can see what it is and decide if this is something that um, you like and want to try at your house and has a low enough threat factor to make you feel comfortable. Um, so, what can be done about window collisions? And this is more of like a large commercial citywide scale. Again, as I talked about, you can, building owners can use FRIT in their construction process. There's, there are many uh, building uh, or glass companies that provide this on a commercial scale. And so having it as part of the bidding process is almost, I mean, in Madison it's become standard you know, because it's required, but it's certainly common enough that it, it's done. Um, so these are two examples of different types of frit. And again, this is a pattern that's baked or etched into the glass, so it's permanent. Um, you can also use different types of design features. So not just building buildings that are big glass blocks, like many buildings are. <laughs> now the, uh, architects can become you know, they can try different styles and methods of designing buildings that um, make it bird safe or bird friendly. Window screens and just having less glass is an excellent way to reduce window collisions. And then if you're um, at the point of already having windows in place and you know that it's a problem, we can put on dot decals, as you see that they're doing here, and as the four examples of window treatments at our bird collision core sites did. Um, <clears throat> Acopian bird savers is another option that uses parachute cord, or paracord, which is like a slippery nylon material to make curtains, and the curtains are extremely effective as well. So those are two different post-installation options. Tempera paint or oil-based markers is another great option. This is at Penny Library, which is my neighborhood library in Madison. Not nearly as big and nice as this one, but it's very nice in its own right. And they have a tempera paint 
uh, um, mural on their glass because they have a pass-through effect situation. So um, tempera paint is washable, so it's not ideal for outdoors, but it can be done on the inside or if um, it's in a protected area. Oil-based markers can achieve the same thing, but with uh, less likelihood to wear off with the weather. And then what can we do at home? Basically everything we just talked about, but on a smaller scale. <coughs> so the goal with whatever uh, window treatment we put up at our houses, um, we want to reduce the transparency of the glass if there's a pass-through effect, and we want to reduce the reflection that's on the window. So the steps for doing this would be to figure out which window is your problem window. And in most cases, it's one or two windows in a house. So raise your hand if you know which window is your problem window. Yeah, that's most folks here. Um, so if you already know, that's great, start there. If you don't know, pay attention because you may uh, quickly find out which ones are the problem ones. You can uh, look through a big long catalog of uh, window treatments that American Bird Conservancy has tested and see which ones you like and want to spend money on and um, have a low material threat factor and, and try that. If you like the style of the window treatment that you put up, you're more likely to leave it up, right? Which is great for birds, but also great for you because you're not doing it twice. You can leave it up for longer. Um, whatever window treatment you do, you'll need to follow the two inch rule with one exception that we'll talk about in a moment. But the two inch rule is whatever is on your glass should be no more than two inches away from the next thing on your glass. There shouldn't be a space more than two inches between any part of your window treatment. And that's because birds are super acrobatic and they will try to fly through a space that's more than two inches. So American Bird Conservancy, again, has done research to find out that um, patterns that use a four inch rule will still have window collisions because of this. So a two inch rule is uh, maximizing your success in reducing collisions. Ideally, your window treatment goes on the outside of the glass because that's what breaks up the reflection, right? The birds can see it on the outside of the glass um, and it doesn't make that tree look like a tree anymore. It looks something different that they don't want to deal with. And then if you put up your window treatment, ideally your problem is solved, right? This isn't a case where if you put up one window treatment, the birds are just going to go and hit another window. It's, it's specific to the window that they see that reflection of the tree or the shrub or the bird bath in. So if you fix that window, it should solve the problem. And if you hear collisions or notice collisions happening, at another window, treat that one, and soon you will be done with the problem. So repeat if necessary. Okay, so the um, first window treatment that I'll suggest to you is the good old fashioned insect screen. This has a material threat factor of one. It is one of the best window treatments you can do. And most of our windows come with insect screens, right? In the winter, a lot of people take theirs down or for take out their window or insect screens down and put them into storage. If that's the case, I encourage you to put them back up on your windows because they'll do a great job. They break up that reflection. They also offer a bit of bounce if something does hit it. So it's a nice option for, um, for reducing collisions. The next option, and I'm only gonna show four because these are the most popular ones that, um, we, that we know people to like. So uh, that's why I suggest these. There are literally hundreds of options. I'm just giving you a little sampler. Tempera or oil-based markers are also um, really effective and very affordable. So a bottle of tempera paint like this, it comes in many different colors, but a bottle like this costs $2.49 at a craft store. So you can um, do a little design on your window for the seasons or maybe like the badger game or whatever you want to do, you can wash it off, put it back up, get your kids or grandkids involved. Um, it's really fun. And at the same time, keep in mind that tempera is washable. So if it rains, your tempera paint will look very sad <laughs> and it will need to be helped. 
So um, it's like I said earlier, it's best done if there's like an overhang and the window is protected and it won't uh, be affected by the rain so much. Oil-based markers achieve the same goal, but they, they have to be removed with like a acetone, like a nail polish remover, so it doesn't come off in the rain. Acetone is, you know, pros and cons, right? Um, but if you're following the two inch rule, this has a very good material threat factor, but they can't assign a material threat factor because it depends on how you put it up, right? So that's why it says variable, but they are very good if they're done right. The next option are these dots. Um, these dots are very popular. Um, some people hate how they look. Some people love how they look and other people say, whatever, I don't care, it's saving birds. These are really effective. Um, they have, depending on the company, about a seven material threat factor. They are um, dots that adhere to your window on the outside, ideally. So they come in rolls like this. So you um, get a, a roll of dots like this and a, uh, like a, a paper ruler, basically, and a squeegee. So you clean your windows really well, you get your roll out, you measure down two inches from the top, you press this onto the glass, use the squeegee to really press the dots on, you pull the tape back, and just the dots remain. And they're rated for outdoor use, even in places like Wisconsin, where we have both crazy hot and crazy cold weather, rain and snow and wind and sun and everything. So these are rated for outdoor um, up to 10 years, but I know of buildings that have had them for 40 years and they're still going strong. And you can also just replace individual dots with, you just cut one out from the roll and stick it back on the window. So they're easy to work with. Um, they're pretty tough to get off. You have to really work at it. So um, that means if you pressure wash your window, it won't take all the dots off. These are semi-permanent stickers, so they stay on for a long time. Um, and what else was I going to say about them? There was something else, but I just forgot. So I'll come back to it, I'm sure. So these dots, um, it depends on where you get them, but I have some up here. Actually, these are part of the raffle. So if you haven't signed up for the raffle, it's right behind Beth. Make sure to sign up because you may win one. But they're about a $25 value. I have some up here that are provided by SOS Save Our Songbirds, which is an um, action campaign in Wisconsin. Um, you can also get them at Wild Birds Unlimited in Middleton, or you can buy them online and there's a coupon code that you can use to get 10% off. So. Sign up for the raffle. And these, so these are good for about um, 16 square feet. So a four by four window or you know, some, some dimension that equals 16 when you uh, measure it out. Okay, so, oh, and if you get them here, Lisa would appreciate a donation to cover the costs. Okay, anyways. So um, another option are these paracord curtains. I have an example of those up in that right window if you can see them. Otherwise, we'll have some time afterwards. You're welcome to come up and, and touch and feel all of these different window treatments. But this uh, curtain is made from paracord. So it's a material, as I mentioned, it's slippery. It doesn't tangle in itself easily. It doesn't decompose quickly. So. Um, you can make a curtain that is basically something that goes horizontally. A lot of people use paracord itself to go across the top. And then you tie paracord from the top so that it dangles down in front of the whole window. And you do that over and over until it covers the entire window. It's called a paracord or bird saver curtain or a zen curtain. Some people think of them or like the way that they move because it's kind of mesmerizing and hypnotic, kind of like a campfire, you know, and it's, you're watching them move in the breeze. Um, because they move and they're not directly adhered to the glass, they don't have to follow the two inch rule as strictly. I see someone nodding like she was wondering about why is the, are those not two inches apart? So um, these can go three inches or even four inches apart because they're usually in motion and they're, they're 3D. So the birds can uh, see them 
better than, or just in a different way. <clears throat> um, paracord is also relatively inexpensive, so you can buy a giant spool of paracord online for like 25 bucks and put it on all of your windows if you want to. Um, this has a really great uh, material threat factor of five. Uh, I have a friend, Susan, actually, who took these pictures. Um, she had a, some issues with collisions at her house, and the last straw was when a red-breasted nuthatch hit her window and died. It was her favorite bird, so she said, enough is enough. I'm going to make one of these curtains and put it up. She had it up for two years without any collisions, and then she needed to get her house painted. So she had to take her curtain down, and within 45 minutes, a bird hit her window. So these, you know, it's, it's stories like that that are just like so good. There's, these are really effective, and the change is instant, you know? So it's, I think, a very empowering thing when we can make such a big change in such a small amount of time with little, um, relatively little effort. So uh, these curtains you can make at home. Um, you know, you could have like a little sewing circle, but with paracord curtains, uh, make it with a friend. My best tip to you is to pre-shrink your paracord. Um, and there's a handout in the back of the room that has a video that shows you how to do this. But the idea is that you want to soak it in hot water and then let it dry so that when it rains for the first time, your cord doesn't shrink up and then you have some inches of window exposed on the bottom. Um, so you can make your own using the instructions we provide or that you can Google or that are on the Bird Savers website. This is a Copian Bird Savers uh, website, the link there. They are a company that invented this concept and they provide instructions on how to make your own or you can order them. They just, they don't care, they just wanna save birds, right? So they have really nice detailed instructions and measurements and numbers of cords you're gonna need, all the, all the information you could need for making these. Or if you would rather not, you can just put in the dimensions of your window and they'll send you a kit pre-made, you just have to hang it up. Yes? Does the color make a difference? So the, does the color make a difference? It just needs to be high contrast. So if you like the look of white, it can be white. If it can, if you like, this is a dark green or black is good, just something that kind of stands out against your window and whatever is reflected. Good question. This one also has a coupon code that SOS Save Our Songbirds has lined up. So um, if you wanna get 15% off, that coupon is good through the end of May. So that, that's for pre-made kits for windows that you just wanna have them send it to you and you hang it up there. So, Many of us have feeders and gardens, and so it's important that we think about window collisions in the same breath as we think about our gardens and feeders and bird baths. So, you know, uh, the idea with this is that we're bringing birds into our yards by having really nice gardens or a nice bird bath or a great bird feeder. We don't want to draw the birds in just to have them hit a window and die right after, right? So this is responsible bird feeding and, and habitat um, provision. So to, to be responsible in this way, we would want to follow what's called the three or 30 rule. If you have something within three, like a bird feeder or a bird bath, whatever it is that is you know, interesting to the bird that they're flying toward, you want to have it within three feet of the house or the building, or more than 30 feet. And the idea with this is um, if it's close to the house, if the bird takes off from the feeder and hits a window, it's not going fast enough that it can hurt itself um, or kill itself. And if it's more than 30 feet away, it's less likely to fly at the window in the first place. So um, regardless of whether you're following this three or 30 rule, the best thing to do is to treat a window that's near a bird feeder or a bird bath or a really great part of your garden that a bird would want to go to. So as you can see in this photo here, uh, they've used the Acopian bird savers method on their windows and right outside are three uh, bird feeders and they haven't had any collisions at this house since they put the uh, Acopian bird savers up. So it's really effective and really great 
responsible bird feeding. So what doesn't work or what doesn't work as well? Many of us have seen these hawk silhouettes at, you know, for sale at like Walmart or wherever. Um, those don't work, <laughs> long story short, because you know, the bird quickly finds out that this is not actually a hawk, right? Like they're, they're smart enough to know that that's not really a bird. And in order for it to follow the two inch rule, you would have to have so many of those that it's not a window anymore, right? So there are a lot of other better ways to treat your windows that are more effective and still allow you to use your window um, and that are better for birds. And again, if you put your window treatment on the inside of the glass, you are improving things in, as far as like the, um, the pass-through effect goes, but you're not changing the reflection on the outside of the glass. So in some cases, you can't put it on the outside of the glass. If you're in a, an apartment building or uh, there's something about the windows where you just can't put it on the outside, if you can put it on the inside, that's great. That's better than nothing. Um, but I do encourage you to see what you can do about putting it on the outside. And because, you know, this is, these are really important parts of our lives. Birds aren't a luxury. I think they're a necessity. And so making these adjustments goes a long way and is worth the effort. So I will leave these resources up here so that you can um, jot them down if you want to. And I would be happy to hear any questions. Monofilament curtains. Monofilament curtains. I don't have much experience with them. Um, and that would be a great thing to look up on the American Bird Conservancy's. That's the first anti-collision I heard of. That was 20 some years ago. Yeah. I'm sure that it's been tested and I've heard of people using them, but not in, um, not in more recent years, given the other alternatives that are available. I just leave my windows dirty, it helps. You know, that really does help. For anyone that needs to hear this, <laughs> dirty windows save birds. Yes? Regarding the window screens, um, presumably that's the same concept. They should, if they're going to do any good, they're on the outside. The yes. Modern window screens are on the inside. So especially if you have like a casement window, like a crank out window, those window screens are on the inside. So yes, you, you st still may need a window treatment on the outside of the glass there. So the insect screen should be on the outside to be, to be serving as a window treatment. Mm -hmm. Good question. What else? I have a question. Yes. So if you are a homeowner and you don't have a bird feeder and you, you don't have a spectacular garden, and you've never noticed dead birds on the ground, would, should you put something up on your windows, or would you say all of those things would indicate you don't have a problem? I would say that if you spend time paying attention um, in a concerted, you know, sort of like your own science project. You know, you go out at the same time in the morning looking, especially during, I would start with fall migration because that's when you're most likely to find them. And you go out every morning and you walk around your house and you do your own survey and you don't find anything. It's, there's a good chance that you don't have a problem with collisions. But um, scavenger removal is high with birds that have hit windows. So we had a, an undergrad, student work with our bird collision core program and they studied uh, scavenger removal rates for birds that have hit windows. So they took birds that had died in previous survey periods that we put in the freezer and they marked them and they put them out on the routes that our volunteers survey. And they told our volunteers, if you see these birds with the, I think it was tape on their leg, don't pick them up because this is part of the project, right? And so, the student went around and like picked up any or looked to see if the birds that they had set out had been picked up not by volunteers, by scavengers, and they found that over a third of them are removed within 24 hours, which is pretty high, and that's just within the first 24 hours. Um, and so there are some places and some species that learn quickly where uh, these collisions happen, and they're more likely to come 
as part of their lunch route, you know, to pick up birds. Raccoons and crows and foxes are very good at this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's not every home, not every home I don't think has a problem, but many do, and um, many of them is just one or two windows. Mm -hmm. Yes? We've had a pretty serious collision and bird death problem. Last fall, I uh, marked on vertical lines kind of a combination of the dots with the uh, hanging cord. Mm -hmm. About three to four inch spacing with parallel vertical lines of white oil based paint, you know, marker. Mm -hmm. And this spring we've had one bird death, and I would say normally we'd, by this time here we'd have 10 or 20 collisions, and we've had two collisions. We're home all the time, we're both retired. Um, in the fall, it is definitely higher, but it, Probably a 90% reduction overall in collisions and you know, a similar reduction in deaths. That's, That's wonderful. Thank but you. I also had a question about um, trying to revive birds. Mm -hmm. um, what observations can you share in regard to the actual success and yeah. survival of birds that we, we've quote unquote revived? Yeah, so um, the University of Pennsylvania did a study on how many birds that, are, that hit a window and then are brought into a rehab facility end up surviving, and only about 25% of birds that are treated by professionals make it. So that's a lot of birds. A lot of birds die after they hit a window, even if they just look stunned and they fly away. Sometimes it's to go to a private place under a shrub where they can die, or they have um, some kind of injury to their eye, for example, that makes them more likely to get picked off by a predator. Uh, so, you know, there are lots of secondary issues that can come from a collision, even if they seem fine. Um, so, if you have a bird that has been injured after a window collision, I would suggest bringing it into a wild wildlife rehabber if you can, um, because they're able to better assess and treat the actual problem. I can tell you from personal experience, I can get 40 per <clears throat> 60 percent relief just with a towel and allowing them to recover uh, from the stress and stunning. Mm -hmm. They lose so much temperature so quickly, yeah. especially in winter strikes. Yeah. Just wrapping them in towel and keeping them warm. Yeah, and especially if it's like a, a quiet, dark place, they're able to kind of just, shake it off. I but but it again, there are a lot of injuries that are not visible from oh, the yeah. outside where they're you know like still able to they, fly. They, they fly away. Sure. Now what happens after that? Yeah, well, we don't know. Fly away. Yeah, right. Mm hmm. You know, 20 or 30 minutes of just laying in a towel and, and you just hold them in your hand at some point and they just go, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to leave. Uh -huh. Try to be nice to them. Yeah, right. You don't want a bird to suffer. Hey, for a sure. hummingbird travels a lot of mileage just to get to and from home. And, That's and, right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, some of these birds are traveling thousands of miles each year and, and so it feels a little rude for a window to get in the way of that. So. Any other questions? I don't have a question, but yes. I will just um, tag on to what John said. We moved out to a house in the country about three years ago that my in-laws had lived there for about 30 years. And after our first year of living there, we were horrified with the amount of birds um, because it's a wooded area and we feed birds out there that hit the windows both in the spring and fall. So two years ago, we put the dot system on almost all the windows and we've had that's amazing. So it would, I mean, it really works. Mm -hmm. Good, good. That's great. So yes. I do have a question. Like, my husband loves the view, right? Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you notice, like, the difference when you see the dot? Like, can you really notice it? Or after a while, you just you don't notice it? After a while, you don't no, notice it. I have to say, when we first put them up, though, I was like, I just, right. Because I don't, actually, I notice it more when I'm outside because you can see. Right. Well, that's the whole point is to be able to see the dots right. on the inside. So you see the white dots. Um, during the winter, people come by and they're like, oh, you put snowflake dots on your back. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. after a while, you just don't notice them. Just, and to me, okay. it's just, yeah. It's, just it's sort of like a window or an insect screen. You know, if you look at it, you can see it, but your eyes really quickly learn to look past it. We have those yeah. color windows that 
that have the window on the outside. So in the winter time, he likes to take the screen down. He's like, because the view is so, so clear. clear. Right. Yes. Right. So yeah. I do the bad thing. Right? Your eyes train your brains to ignore it. Right. Yeah. And I think that's what's going to happen. Great. Dirty I'm windows. so glad to hear it. I'm that was really dirty successful. Windows. It's yeah. A lot there you go. All right. Anything else? Okay. Well, if you haven't signed up for the raffle, maybe you can have an extra couple minutes, and you can scurry back and do that. Or there's um, lots of things to check out. So feel free to move around and come feel and look at these examples close up. You did Thank, you. Well. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.